put into his time. So I'll give him a round of applause. <laughs> What's up, guys? Uh, can you hear me in the back? Yes? Number one, I have some pretty uh, severe allergies, so if I crack, do not make fun of me too much, okay? I've been really, really wanting to get in front of some students, some medical students, people in, in uh, graduate school, and so I am extremely, extremely thankful for this opportunity to speak to you guys. My name is Ryan Proudfoot. Uh, I am a pastor of Young Adults in Worship at a church across town as well as I get the opportunity to travel and speak. I am a singer, so I, I sing songs and put them on albums that some people listen to, and I do not. Um, you can find that and listen to it and pay me no money on Spotify. We'll talk about that later. Um, but today's message that we're gonna talk about is called Distracted. Um, a little introduction here, I have a question for you guys. Have you ever in your life uh, been alone? Like, been completely isolated, Jesus, 40 days in the desert, alone. And I'm not talking about you saying, well, last night I was, like, so Netflix and chilling, and, like, I was super alone. It was, like, really a lonely. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this idea of, like, have you ever been, like, completely set aside from friends, from familiar environments, uh, from your cultural context? from people that you connect with, from your cell phone, right? Have you ever been completely isolated? Well, I don't know about you, but about four or five years ago, I was afforded this opportunity to go to Granada, Spain. Anybody ever been to, to Spain? Incredibly beautiful place, right? But there I was with a team of 12 people that I didn't really know. We didn't have a similar life stage that we could connect with. And so here I was in this foreign country with people I didn't know that I couldn't really connect with. My cell phone didn't work. Nobody spoke English. And so I'm completely alone out here in the most beautiful place in the world. And yet I felt just so off. And I really found out what my relationship with Jesus was really made of was really built upon, completely set aside from everything that could distract me, right? And you see, we live in an age and a day now where there are so many distractions. There are so many things that um, try to take away our focus, so many things that try to pull away our attention, they try to draw our hearts to them, um, and we really don't even know what our relationship with Christ is made of at times, right? So this idea of being distracted, I wanted to talk about this morning with you guys, but I thought it might be uh, wise to define this word distraction. So I looked on a really credible source, Google. I don't know if you guys use that here in the medical field, um, but I, I searched the word distraction on Google, and I found that a distraction is a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something else, right? Many of you are looking at me right now thinking, sir, you are the distraction <laughs> that is stopping me from studying right now. I would agree. Uh, just 20 more minutes and we will be done with this distraction. So something that prevents you from giving full attention to something else. But in our day and age now, I would say that there are kind of three distinct types of distractions. There are what I would call unnecessary distraction. There are things that I would say are an unnecessary distraction. And then there's the third group that uh, maybe is a little more uh, ice or uh, camouflage, what I would call an idolized distraction, right? So here's, here's a few that I'm going to name, and you, and you see what you think. Necessary distractions in our lives today. One, meals, right? I mean, some of you are thinking, dude, I mean, you're eating a meal right now, okay? <laughs> so you're like, you know, Chipotle, I'll get distracted for that every day, all day. The problem is what ensues on the latter half is also a distraction called the restroom from Chipotle. So um, <laughs> necessary distractions, right? Things like sleep, traffic, bills, showers. Who's tired of being distracted by showers? We know you are. We smell you from here. Okay? One of my least favorite distractions is brushing my teeth. I just hate brushing my teeth. Can I get an amen? 
try to lure us away from the thing we are supposed to be focused on. Some unnecessary distractions. Things like Netflix, right? I was searching this today. I figured out that you could spend three years, 202 days, 12 hours, and 14 minutes watching episodes of Netflix. Some of you are on your way to that. <laughs> anybody, can anybody think of some unnecessary distractions? School? <laughs> <laughs> you sure you're doing well? Uh, so, I mean, social media apps, let's just talk about those Facebook, Instagram. Anybody got a Tinder? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to see if you'd raise your hand. We could just look right instead of swipe right, all right? Um, Spotify, iTunes, email, movies, Snapchat, YouTube, TV, and the worst one of all, the cell phone. This thing is the devil. Right? <laughs> Dude, when you wake up, there it is. When you're using the restroom, there it is. <laughs> When you drive in your car, when you're at dinner with a friend, this guy is always luring and buzzing and beeping and vying for your attention. I ran into an old friend of mine, a pastor, and I saw him at this coffee shop, and he had a cricket flip phone. And I was like, I mean, I'm not trying to judge, bro, but like, I mean, if you want service out of Bear County, you're going to have to get something else. And he was just talking about how his phone is such a distraction in his life. And he had downgraded his flip phone because he did not want to be... Uh, you know, his attention taken away from the things he really wanted to focus on, right? I thought that was really cool. And so we have these necessary, these unnecessary distractions. And then what I would title is something that's a little more camouflage in our life called an idolized distraction, right? This is taking what, what would be a typical distraction and not, not only allowing it to divert your attention from what you want to be focused on, but it's taken out of its desired or its typical context to derive life from it rather than it be a part of your life, right? For instance, things like when you live to work instead of you work to live, or you, you live to eat instead of eat to live, or you live to sleep instead of sleep to live, right? But then there's also these things that I was thinking about when I think about my own distractions, things like unmet desires things in your life that you desire that have not come to fruition and they distract you constantly, day after day, clouding your mind and your judgment. Things like future seasons, where you want to be, the job you want to get to, the city you want to be in. Some of you aren't very fond of San Antonio, Texas. I don't know why we have the Spurs, but that could be clouding your judgment. <laughs> Thinking about that consistently, where am I going to be? And do you don't enjoy or receive what God is doing in your life right now. That's an idolized distraction. Things like self. You become so consumed with yourself and your own problems, so distracted with what's going on in you, what's wrong with you, what's unmet with you, that you can't see other people around you. You can't see what God is doing in your life right now. The one thing that kills my evangelism strategy of sharing the gospel with as many people as I can meet is me. I get distracted with me. I see my problems, and I can't see anyone else. Right? Can I get an amen? Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. amen. So I want to read a passage of scripture from one of the most notoriously distracted people in the Bible. A story found in Luke chapter 10. If you guys have a Bible, uh, you can flip there. If you have it on your, on your uh, devil phone, pull that up. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Very well-known story. Uh, the story of Martha and Mary, two women who were very close to Jesus. Um, very prominent in his ministry. And I want to read this together and, and talk about how it applies to our lives. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Here's what the Word of God says. <clears throat> now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. 
But Martha was distracted with much serving. She went up to him and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled, distracted about many things. There is only one thing that is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Now, you know what's interesting about this particular passage is it follows a story where Jesus, he is talking to a lawyer who is trying to figure out who his neighbor is. And so Jesus tells this lawyer, this is what the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, looks like. And then Luke records this story of Mary and Martha on what it looks like to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The first and greatest commandment. But here, what is so interesting, this passage is super dense. We could pull a million sermons from this passage alone. But specifically, I love verse 40. If you look at this, verse 40. But Martha was distracted with much serving. Isn't that, I mean... That's kind of a curious statement. Like, I mean, who attributes serving to be something that would distract you from the Lord? I mean, doesn't want God, doesn't God want us to serve? The Bible says that Jesus came to serve, not to be served, but to be a ransom for many. I mean, God wants us to serve, right? I mean, are we called to serve like him? You know, I would understand that Jesus was like, Martha, you are distracted with too much. Spotify. <laughs> or the version might be like Synagogue Fi or something. I don't know in their, in their day and age. Or Martha, you are distracted with too much Netflix. Or their version be like She Flocks or something. <laughs> you see, even the most noble of endeavors for God, if they pull us from the one thing that is truly necessary, the good portion, communion with Jesus, these things can be negative in our lives. Jesus wouldn't take this from Mary. How easily we can be in Christ-like environments and still be so distracted from the one thing that is necessary, communion with Jesus, right? So why, here's a question, why do we choose distractions over God in our lives? We are so easily distracted, so much clutter, so many things going on. God is vying for our attention for our allegiance, to spend time with him, to be with Jesus, and we would rather choose distractions. Why do we do that? Well, I wrote a couple things down here. Let's see if you agree with any of these. Number one, we are far too easily pleased with lesser things. We are far too easily pleased with lesser things. C.S. Lewis said it like this, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. This is the fast food culture. Jesus is inviting you to a Thanksgiving feast to offer and commune with him. And we would rather have jack-in-the-box tacos through the drive through line. <laughs> who are far too easily pleased with lesser, lesser things. Second reason why I think I choose distractions over God is I am terrified of what God would speak if I got quiet. What would God say about your current lifestyle choices, about what you're doing and engaging in, about what you're pursuing, if you got quiet and actually listened? But we are terrified of hearing what God might say about our lives. So what do we do? We run. We disengage. We fall back. We don't spend time in the Word because we know that if we spend time in the Word, we have to renew our mind rather than conforming to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might test and approve what God's good, pleasing, and perfect will is. But we are terrified of what God might say. So we disengage. We run. We distract ourselves as much as possible so we might not hear what He might say about our lives. Psalm 139, at the very end of this passage, David says, Lord, if there be any grievous way in me, lead me in the way everlasting. What a prayer. 
God, I'm coming before you. Here's my hands. Here's my heart. If there's anything that I'm doing that I'm distracting myself is pulling me from you, let me know. Right? It's a powerful prayer. The third reason I think that it's so easy to distract myself instead of spend time with God is it is much easier to work than to rest. You guys know about this. You're medical students. You never rest. You're always studying, always doing something, always checking somebody's pulse. You know? I don't know if you guys do that. I feel like that probably happens a lot. Me, I, you know, I'm out there preaching the gospel, out there like putting shoulders back in socket, you know? And that's awesome. But being with Jesus, it requires rest. It's much easier for me in my profession. I experience this a lot. It's easier to work for God than it is to spend time with God. Much easier getting alone, putting aside the distractions to just be with God is difficult. So, what is the antidote to the distracted life? How can we all in here spend time with Jesus? How can we pull ourselves from the things that vie for our affection and our hearts and our allegiance day after day that we're giving ourselves to that are lifeless, that are not pouring life into us? What's the antidote? Well, I'll preface with this. Number one, there is no perfectly balanced life. Right? Everyone in here is working to have a more balanced life, to spend more time with God, to manage your time well. This is a myth. It doesn't exist. Okay? You get out of balance trying to be too balanced. You know what I mean? Okay? That happens. Just understand that. But as it relates to this passage, I'll look at verse 41 back in, in the text in Luke chapter 10. Verse 41 says this. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but there is only one thing that is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. The answer is the good portion. Communion with Jesus. This is said in Psalm 16, 5. David says it like this. The Lord is my portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance, right? This passage, as David says this, this is an allusion to Numbers 18.20, right? Old book in the Pentateuch, this is what it says. The Lord said to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in the land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion. The tribes of Israel, 12 tribes, were allotted these pieces of land. But the Levites, the men who dwelt in the tent of meeting and did the work for God, got no portion. They got no land. God said to them, you know what's your land? You know what's your portion? Me. I'm your portion. I am your allotment. I am your inheritance. You need nothing more than me. And David here, he's recounting this and saying, Lord, you are my portion. In Psalm 16, 2, here he says, I have no good apart from you. I don't need Spotify. I don't need Netflix. I don't need kingdoms and mansions. Here's a king known as a man after God's own heart who had everything at his dispense, whatever he wants. And yet he says, I have no good except you, God. That's the antidote for a distracted life. The Lord is my portion. This is the good portion. Communion with Jesus. We can distract ourselves with Christ-like environments all we want. But there is nothing better than being on your knees, spending time alone with God. There will never be a better place. So many times I go into my closet and I'm praying. You know what I'm thinking about? Where I'm about to go. <laughs> the good things I'm about to experience. The cool things I'm about to do today. And I have to remind myself, you know what I remind myself? This is going to be the best part of my day. This is the best place I will be today. Yeah. Right now, with Jesus, the King of Kings, pouring into my heart, spending time with me, pouring his love into me that I might be an overflowing vessel for everyone I talk to. There will be no better place than where I am right now, this morning. Yeah. And that's what we have to choose to believe every day so that these distractions do not take and buy for our time and our life. We know, no, we have the good portion. We don't have to go look for it. Now, when we leave this place in this time with Jesus, we go tell everyone about it. Because you can be in environments like this and not know what that tastes like. You can go to church your whole life and not know what it's like to have the good portion in Jesus Christ. To commune with him one on one. To have that overflowing river of life pouring through you. 
that you hunger and thirst for righteousness. You want to know God because this is the most satisfying thing you can have. When I got saved, I would go home after baseball practice and I would read the Bible for hours until I fell asleep. Because it was the only place where I could find life. I was, I was so depressed, so alone. And this was the only place that I found peace. I would eat these words. I would read the Bible all day. As deer pants for flowing streams, so my soul pants for you, oh God, right? This is where I was. This is where I wanted to be. And so many times in my life, I've allowed other things to distract me from that which I know is best for me, right? That's what God wants for you today. Just know this. For all of the things that you have to be a part of, for all of the studying, the incredible things God is going to do with each and every one of you in this place, through the medical field, in your families, with your friends, you will never have anything better than the good portion of being with Jesus every day, <laughs> spending time with Him, abiding in Him, getting alone with Him, and just receiving, talking, and listening with Jesus, sitting at His feet for His teaching. So the application this afternoon is just today. Choose Jesus. Choose the good portion. For all of the things you're a part of, for all the distractions that buy for your attention, choose today to find some time and get along with God and just say, you know what, God? You are the greatest thing about my life. And right now, I want to hear from you. And if you have to turn off your radio dial and just sit there in the car and listen, God will drive the car. Just bow your head right there. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, I receive you. And then when you open your eyes, you'll probably be in heaven, too. <laughs> All right, guys. I just want you to know God is going to use you guys. You're going to be incredible. You're going to do incredible things for the kingdom of God through the medical field, through cleaning people's teeth or whatever it is y'all are going to be doing. I'm going to need some of y'all. If you have any allergy prescriptions. Because the other thing about ministry is there is no money. So come to our church. You can be a part of what God is doing. Um, but anyways, just know, I know I cannot imagine what it is like to be a medical student to be so distracted at times, so many things vying for your attention, so many responsibilities, so many priorities. Find some time this week, today, tomorrow. Get along with Jesus and realize that is the best thing you're going to experience Amen. this week. The best thing you'll ever have in your life is to be with the King of Kings in communion, right? Amen? Amen. 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 Let me pray for you guys. Uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for your presence. Thank you that communion with you is the best thing we will ever experience, God. And we cast off any distractions, um, any hindrances in our life that pull and buy for our allegiance beyond you, Jesus. And we just ask you to give us the the, the self-control, God, the, uh, the power and the will to get along with you. And, Lord, would you spark our hearts to believe that you are the best thing for our life again. If we return us to the joy of our salvation, if, we, if our love has wandered and waned for you, God, I pray that you would spark our hearts, that we would hunger and thirst for righteousness again, God. Because I know in and of myself I, I fail at that so many times, and yet your grace and your presence pulls me close. You want nothing to hinder me from intimacy with you. So I pray for these students today, God, that they would know how much you love and desire to meet with them, and you have great things in store for them. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.